Long Beach, California, this is GovLove, a podcast about local government, brought to you by engaging local government leaders. I'm Meredith Reynolds, Deputy City Manager with the City of Long Beach and GovLove co-host. We have a great episode for you today. We're talking about parks and being an enthusiast in your own profession with Anthony Iraqi. But first, the best way to support GovLove is to become an ELGL member. ELGL is a professional association engaging the brightest minds in local government. Check us out and learn more about membership at elgl.org. Now let me introduce today's guest. Anthony Iraqi, pronouns he, him, currently serves as a professional development manager at PlayCorp. Prior to that, Anthony serves as the Director of Education and Training for the Michigan Recreation and Parks Association and spent time serving communities in the Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and Milwaukee, Wisconsin metro areas. Having worked in the Parks and Rec field since the age of 14, Anthony is passionate about community engagement, innovative programming, and equity in parks and recreation. Alongside his commitment to his community, he is active in the growth and development of Parks and Rec professionals and agencies through his volunteer work, network leadership positions, speaking engagements, podcasting, and authoring articles related to the field. Anthony is a recipient of the 2020 NRPA Robert W. Crawford Young Professional of the Year Award. Outside of work, Anthony enjoys hiking with his dog, Samson, collecting watches, and traveling. Welcome to GovLove, Anthony. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. I've been a long time fan of ELGL and the podcast itself, so it's an honor to actually be able to talk with you today and be a part of it. Excellent. And you're a podcaster yourself. You've done a lot of work. We'll talk about that. But it, is it in, fun to be on the other side? Yeah, I always feel like I get a little bit more nervous when I'm the host. Um, I know you've <laughs> got the heavy lift today uh, because you've got to pay attention and you've got to kind of run the ship and run the show and everything that goes into it. So when you're the guest, you kind of get to show up and chat and talk about something you're passionate about. So it's a little bit it's fun on both sides, but I would say it's a little bit more easygoing on this side. Oh, excellent. Well, let's start with a lightning round to get to know you a little bit better. So what was the first music album that you bought? All right. So you're actually going to like this one being out in California. One of the first albums I bought was the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Nice. And I rem- <laughs> I remember when I was younger on VH1 pop-up video, they would have um, all their their music videos come on. And I was just so into it. And I thought they were so catchy. And then as soon as I got some money when I was older from allowances, I remember I went out. And I want to say the first album I got was, um, I think it was, I want to say it was Californication, honestly. It was the first one that I picked up. So it was... Yeah, definitely West Coast influence with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I love that. I love that. I've seen them live uh, at the Staples Center in Los Angeles. Um, Great performers, great presence, um, and definitely quintessential California. Nice choice. Thank you. I've also seen them live in Milwaukee, so that was a dream come true to my younger self. So we have that in common. Very cool. All right, so what are you reading right now? I'm actually reading a really cool book. It's called Sweetwater. And so it's uh, this author who you'd mentioned that I have an interest in watches and kind of a lot of just watches, outdoor gear, bushcraft, things of that nature. And this guy is named Jason Heaton. He grew up in Milwaukee and he lives in Minneapolis at the moment, but he has a big connection to the Great Lakes region. And so Sweetwater is his second book. Um, and it's very much in the theme of those kind of like classic James Bond or Clive Cussler type adventure books, but it's based out of the upper peninsula. So I really like it. Um, it's pretty easy read. I would say it's kind of just one you could take. I'm kind of moving through it kind of quickly, definitely like a weekend read, but if you're looking for something that's related to diving and adventure and great lakes and upper peninsula and classic cars and gear and all that fun stuff um i'm enjoying it quite a bit so very nice what about the last movie or tv show you watched so i'm currently re-watching mad men um outside of that the newest show i've watched is called alone so mad men i'm a sucker for mid-century 
Uh, I like a good period piece and I just like the show in general. And then the show alone is about people who it's a competition where they have to go survive and whoever survives the longest actually wins mm-hmm. a half a million dollars. But a gentleman from Grand Rapids, where I'm at, won the second season. Oh, so wow. spoiler, if you're going to go through. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's, it's really interesting to watch um, and just kind of go through it. So it's it's been really great. So I would definitely say if you're like myself, an enthusiast in the outdoors and into a little bit more of the camping at that next level, it's definitely a good show to check out. Nice. All right. Last right, lightning round question here. Where do you go for inspiration? You know, this is a fun one for me. Um, you know, I, I find a lot of inspiration in my peers Definitely. I'm always excited to see what other people are up to and what innovative ways they're running programs or cool ideas are coming up with. But honestly, I would say my biggest inspiration is through art. Um, you know, I it's you kind of look at art and it can be abstract or surrealist or whatever art is to you and that, that you like. But when you go and you check out a local artist in the gallery and you kind of see somebody that is very creative in their process and they produce something, I find it inspiring and it makes me want to come back and be an artist in my own profession as well, too. And so how can I do something different, take a chance, take a risk, produce something that people might like and it might not be for everybody else? Um, but it's just it's just kind of fun. So I would say that art, music, um, things like that are definitely a big inspirational draw for me. And then again, of course, my peers and other park and rec professionals, just the really cool ways that they're engaging with their communities also. Excellent. Well, that leads us into our first question here. Uh, when did you first catch the parks and nature bug? Let's talk a little bit about how those experiences led you to work in the parks and rec world in local government. Well, you know, I grew up a park and rec kid. Um, you know, I was my my brother and sister. I'm 13 years younger than my siblings, and my brother and sister were camp counselors at our summer day camp. And I remember going to the pool every day as a kid, and being in camp, and being outside. And I grew up in a small town in Michigan called Coldwater, which is a bit rural towards the southern the southern border near Indiana. And, you know, I was fortunate and very privileged that I also grew up with a lot of nature around me and there was a lake nearby as well, too. And so I think just going through the programs, those experiences, the way I made memories and the fun that I really had as a kid um, in that in those programs. And then also just being outside, being with my neighborhood friends, running around, spending every single day that we could. And you know, when you're younger, it doesn't matter if it's cold, if it's hot, if it's whatever, you just want to be in the outdoors. And so it really um, deeply impacted me. Um, It really gave me a strong sense of pride and accomplishment to be able to be in the outdoors and different feats and tasks. Like, can I swim this far? Can I run this far? Can I climb this hill? Can I do all these different things? And You know, I don't know if it's going to kind of come up later in the conversation. I'll just re-reference it if it does. But you know, something that really was impactful to me as a child, too, is that I, you know, basically raised like an only child. And so I, you know, as a kid, I was bigger than most kids. I was heavy set. I was taller. And usually when you're a kid, sometimes too, that can put a target on you for being picked on and bullied and different things. And so, you know, it was always something where I found a lot of confidence and solace and peace being out in nature and it was a way to really take those negative experiences I might have at school or in any other instance and turn them into a positive and so I think all those form formulations through my formative years everything that came together really just inspired me throughout my life I mean as soon as I could was old enough to get a job in the state of Michigan I was working for the local park and recreation department so it just really the bug has kind of just always been there. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds very, you know, that that being outside and being able to kind of run around, very like Huckleberry Finn upbringing, right? Where you can kind of, you know, self-direct <laughs> your, your activities. Well, that's a pretty yeah. neat and special place to be where you have access to a lot of that, right? Not everyone has equal access to parks and recreation mm-hmm. spaces and you know, really thinking about those spaces as that respite and that solace um, for for a whole host of things, physical activity, mental health, 
connection. Um, pretty special thing uh, from a child to, to kind of get that experience. So um, what sorts yeah. of work have you been responsible for in your parks and rec roles over the years, kind of translating that, you know, when you're 14 and, and you're able to kind of start working to where you are today? And are there any particular unique experiences that stand out that you might have been involved with? Well, I, I think I'm very fortunate in this industry because I've, I've had the opportunity to kind of float through the park and rec space and view it from multiple different lenses. So, you know, starting out in municipal government in the part-time role as a lifeguard, you know, and working at the local pool and just even when it was, when I was younger, just the scorekeeping for rec league basketball and softball. And then ultimately I started my career as an aquatics director at the YMCA. So now you're in um, more of like a franchise recreation nonprofit space. And then from there, jumping back into parks and recreation um, in the, in Milwaukee, where it was a good mix of traditional local municipal government, but also Wisconsin is a bit unique because it has a very large community recreation education component too. So when I worked for the city of Milwaukee for Milwaukee Recreation, I was actually a part of the school district. And that was kind of common throughout the state is that the rec department was through the district. And then a lot of the land management was typically through the county um, oh, interesting. or other, other agencies. Yeah. So we, it's, it's kind of, if you're a programmer, which I would say when it comes to the industry, my lens is always programming is my strength, right? If, you know, some mm -hmm. people are very good at land management. Some people are very good at the tax part and mills and bonds and all these different things. You know, I was always very comfortable engaging with the community, community outreach and programming. And so I was fortunate because, you know, and when you're with community rec and education, you're through a school district. So the money that comes in is there typically is funding for the recreation, but then a lot of it is tied to the school. So if the school comes in and they're like, well, we want to redo the football field and put better turf down. I'm like, well, that's fantastic because I run my flag football leagues out there, you know? So I don't have to worry about as a recreation department, redeveloping a community center. Cause there's a lot of the, the funding flows through the school and they're updating gymnasiums and classrooms and technology and all these different things. So it is, and again, if you're a programmer, then it's a really great place to be, but you don't really have a lot of facility management or land management that goes into it. So if that's your passion, then the community ed departments wouldn't necessarily be the best route for you. And so I'd say that was a pretty unique experience. Um, mm -hmm. And hopping over to the association management side of things where I was for a number of years in strictly professional development through M parks. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that as well, too, because it was still it was programming. It was educational, it was experiential. I still got to work with park and rec professionals. I got to travel around the state quite a bit. And I was you know, I've always taken advantage of my position where you can be creative and you can do cool things and you can plan stuff and then you can participate in what you plan in. So if you're a programmer at a community center and you're like, well, I want to learn about wood carving or geocaching or <laughs> right. you know, like all these, my job in Milwaukee was always something I was interested in. I tracked down an instructor and then run it at my community center and then I would just supervise it. You know, I had a lot of fun. And with M parks, it was kind of the same thing. Like, wouldn't it be cool to do a two day workshop that's, at this outdoor center in the middle of the state and we stay overnight and yeah, so let's schedule it and people will come, you know, just, I like put together some really fun things. And so my current role, I'm relatively new in, I think it's just a little bit over a month. Um, so I'm really excited about the direction I can go with this. It's at much more of a national level, um, engaging, you know, still in that parks and recreation space, just a different, a different lens and a different approach to everything. And so, but I would say that, I would say they've all been kind of unique in their own way and they've all been really enjoyable. And I, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's having fun. I think that's one of the best parts of the job and in our industry is that it's a fun industry and, you know, there's parts of every job that are always challenging, but who else can say, well, you know, if you do event management, you're like how cool would it be to do a, an open streets event or how cool would it be to do this type of dance or this new progressive thing or this sma pumpkin smashing or whatever, you schedule it, people show up, and then you get to go try it out too. I mean, what's not to love about that, you know? So Right. 
Well, we talk about uh, with with my teams about how you spend a lot of your waking hours at work or with the people that you work with. And so Mm -hmm. it it behooves you really to be uh, in a space of joy and enjoy what you do. And so it definitely sounds like uh, you have followed and and pulled that thread and and kind of followed that adventure, which sounds uh, pretty rad. So, yeah. Well, I saw, uh, you know, you, uh, when I was in the Parks and Rec space, kind of following you on Instagram years ago, and I watched kind of your progression and the types of things that you're involved in 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 Parks and Rec kind of, um, you know, through that lens. And I've seen you coin this phrase, exploring what it's like to be an enthusiast in your own profession. And I've always been intrigued by that phrase. So can you tell me a little bit more about what does that mean? And, and how did you come upon uh, that kind of uh, theme? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, it's, it's something I felt. You know, I think that I have a lot of passion for the work that we do. And I've always really enjoyed it. And growing up as a park and rec kid. And I just love bringing people together. Honestly, like I think that at the end of the day, sometimes we can get so caught up in what we do, but at the end, but really what we're doing is, I mean, sometimes we're just throwing a party, you know what I mean? (laughs) It's a family party, it's an event, it's all these different things and it's really cool. And I, you know, I was all through, like when I was younger, I was always the host, you know, my friends would come over to my house, let's all hang out here, we'll camp out, we'll be in the backyard, we'll do a bonfire you know, I remember when I was my graduation party. And so I don't know how graduation parties are from high school by you. But when in my town, it was very usually kind of like a semi formal event, like you, the graduate would be dressed up and people would come by and they leave an envelope and there usually be some cash in it and yada, yada, yada. And in my graduation party, I got I got no money, I nothing at all, because people showed up and I like people showed up and we'd throw them in the lake. We were, then we had a bonfire and we hung out and we had water balloons and just like shaving. It was just, you know, it was just a good time. And so. I want to come to this party. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. I was like, it's a graduation party. Like we're going to, we're going to go through with that. And so, you know, then through college kind of similar and then getting into the real world and the profession, like I realized right away, I'm like, oh, I'm inviting people into a space. Like I'm inviting them over to come to a space that I'm in control of and that I'm leading and I want them to have a good experience and I want it to be fun and I want it to be enjoyable. And that coupled with just the love of nature, the mental health benefits, the physical health benefits, the emotional, all the good stuff that comes with just going for a walk or a hike or being around water, or like all the other things that exist with it, it all just blended together. And I was like, do I have a, a job? Is this a jo- Is this my job? Is this actually what I do? Because I love what I do because when I'm at work, I'm in parks and community centers. And when I'm not at work, I'm just right back in parks and community centers. And so, you know, enthusiasts in your own profession or parks and recreation at the intersection of personal and professional is something I say as well too. And it just all kind of made sense and it all just ties back into the idea that we have such a great industry to work in because it is so fun. And if you embrace it for what it is, you can really create something cool and you're going to, like you said, you spend a lot of time at work. You spend a lot of time with the people at work. And so just, you know, my hobbies have really blended in with my profession. I won't sit here and say that I love what I do. I've never worked a day in my life because that's not true, but it just, it was just an emerging trend. And so as I was developing out a personal blog, as I was going on other podcasts throughout my career, as I was just kind of navigating the space, it was just something that always showed up. And I felt like that is the lens, the angle that if somebody comes across any of my content on the internet, that that is what they're going to find mm-hmm. either visually or in words. And that's what you did find. So that means that it's working, which is fantastic. Yeah, well, and I think the parks and rec space has a really great opportunity that uh, that some other local government professions don't, right? So I think about that phrase of exploring what's like to be an enthusiast in your own profession. I don't know that mm-hmm. accounting screams that, right? I don't know <laughs> that like engineering might, maybe it does, but I, you know, there's some of the other professions that 
um, you, it, you, you don't have that opportunity for kind of full immersion and where the personal and professional sort of um, inter, intersect. And so it's a really kind of unique space to be in and, and having spent a lot of time in parks and community services in my career, um, I think that phrase for me was really uh, really resonated with me, uh, which is one of the the fun things that you get to find about um, what some of the ELGL ELGLers call pocket friends, right? People on the internet that you don't know, but that are you know uh, kind of aligned with mission and values, um, and doing some cool stuff out in the world. So I'm glad that I I ran a- across that all those years ago. But you mentioned uh, something about being a podcaster yourself. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard you on, on a variety of these, uh, which is one of the, the reasons I asked you to be here. Um, but as you've done that, that uh, work as a podcaster, you've covered a wide range of topics uh, relevant to those in Parks and Rec and local government and, and other topics. Um, thinking back, what are some of the more impactful topics that were meaningful to you that you covered? That's a really good question. Um, you know, when I was first getting into podcasting, a colleague of mine, Becky Dunlap, and I did, it was called Let's Talk Parks. And this was, oh boy, this had to be like around the time of the pandemic, quite honestly. We had just started and the pandemic hit. And we had the opportunity through Let's Talk Parks to have some really impactful conversations with professionals from across the country. And, you know, we kind of referencing back to what we talked about earlier with not everybody having the opportunity to get outside. Um, you know, there was a woman I spoke with out of, I think it, if I'm pronouncing it right, Broward County down in Florida. Um, her name was Atia, And we talked about just like urban, I want to say it's kind of like, like, so the idea of, you know, you take kids from an urban area that maybe doesn't have a lot of green space, doesn't have a lot of different things going, you know, unfortunately at the time, and then taking them out of that space to maybe a field trip to a park or a nature center or whatever it is. And then they come back and then they don't have it there. And so the importance of how, you know, just bringing those programs, bringing green space, bringing all that stuff to where people actually are. And and our conversation at the time kind of focused on, you know, why is it important that kids are aware of the nature in their backyard? Why is it important that they have access to parks? Why is it important that green space is there? Why is it important, you know, all these things that kind of play into it. So you don't have to leave to go find it. And even if it is minimal where you are, then also what actually exists, like what birds or animals or or wildlife and things of that nature. And so, but I remember, you know, that the reason I bring up Let's Talk Parks is because there was a couple of times I had some conversations as a host of that show where it was a learning opportunity for me. And like I said, this was four years ago. And I remember when we were having that conversation saying, backyard. And she said to me, you know, Anthony, not everybody has a backyard. I'm like, you're right. right. Not everybody has a backyard, you know? Right. And so those little kind of just moments of growth and learning and being in a space with somebody who I knew and I was comfortable with and that, you know, we could have that open dialogue and then being able to learn and admit in that space that I need to open my mind to be better and engage. And so I think Throughout the years, you know, I've always tried to apply a lens to the conversations I've had where what is the perspective of the person that I'm talking with? What can I learn from them? You know, the world doesn't, my world personally, my day to day is my lived experience, but the entire rest of the world doesn't operate like that. And so how can I try to understand how others operate as well? And so that kind of grew into, you know, learning more about inclusion in parks and spaces and accessibility and just equity and you know all these other things that are topics that are coming more and more to the forefront and have over the years especially post pandemic as more people are spending time outdoors and the importance of nature is really emphasized that i think that those initial seated conversations as being a host of that series really laid a lot of groundwork for me to grow um and then also i mean that built on a lot of my other past experiences as well too 
but that was nice to be able to talk to people from around the country for an even more broad view again against my own lived experiences so yeah that, that the some of those learning moments are are really key i can think about you know one here that that we've experienced in long beach you know we have 169 parks, 3,200 acres of open space, but we have uh, areas of our, our community. They are um, typically uh, areas of our where our populations of color live, and they're you know 15 minutes from or 10 minutes from say the beach, and some mm -hmm. of the youth have never been there, and that sort of blows mm -hmm. my mind. But it's also you know about. Um, access and privilege and equity and some of the, mm -hmm. um, you know, systems of systemic racism that are stacked up against these communities that have impacted them over over the years and kind of understanding that in the context of access to to parks that are so uh, important and have been for years. Um, and and as, as you mentioned, sort of uh, heightened and uplifted as part of the uh, pandemic, um, you know, how really then sort of re- uh, re-envisioning how uh, you, you work with these communities to think about things like access and equity. And so such a, a key learning moment for you. Um, and, and also for me, as we've gone through some of this work um, that I encourage everyone to sort of dig into and um, embrace with, with an open mind because it just makes us all mm -hmm. better. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Yeah. So the other thing about uh, Parks and Rec um, that I've seen over the years, and I wanted to ask you about, was um, this act, this concept of, you know, parks folks as, uh, you know, kind of leisure uh, leaders or you know arbiters of fun, and you know, sort of this aspect of, um, you know, their the work not being perhaps as professional. Uh, as some of the other things that you might encounter, say, in local government or county government or whatnot. Um, and I'm always surprised at how talented folks in Parks and Rec are uh, and, and what they're able to pull together at the drop of a hat um, and the connections that they've made with community and partners, you know, to kind of get everyone excited and moving in the same direction toward a common goal. Um, what are a few things from your perspective that you would like city managers, local government, leadership, uh, and, and others in that space to know about Parks and Rec professionals from your uh, perspective? Yeah, that's a really good question. I know, um, you know, navigating a career in Parks and Recreation is interesting because I think sometimes we get a bit siloed in our work and we can forget that being a Park and Rec director is a municipal administrative position, right? And there's a lot of politics that goes into that. There's a lot of different things that roll with it. Um, and sometimes, you know, people who are in recreation director roles, park and recreation director roles, it might be that they're just a really good administrator. And there was somebody that is trusted by the, the leadership at the top, and they're kind of moved over into it. Um, and that can take you so far. And that's not to say that there aren't departments in every profession and industry where sometimes just a really hard look at administrative policies and processes is what can get things back on track or get things moving in a different direction. But it's kind of those things I would say are definitely more of like a, a short term solution. Right, you know, and so what my advice out there would be, you know, look at your park and recreation department, as your creatives, as your community outreach, as your engagement, as all the things that people want, you know, I mean, there are elements of local government that, you know, you can be an accountant at local government, or you can be an accountant at a nonprofit or a for-profit, you can come in and run management, you can run in and do operations, you can do all these things. But at the end of the day, forward facing in the community, this is an opportunity for engagement. It's an opportunity for people to feel connected to their local government, to feel part of the community, to feel bought in for that outreach. And it really, all these programs that we have, parks and open spaces, recreation programs, fun events, all the stuff that goes on, this is what gives people a very strong sense of place and a tie to where they are and what builds neighborhoods and builds out those deep relationships and connections. Um, you know, our industry, we're a facet of an industry that is within municipal government, but somebody who is 
at an apartment complex and just puts flyers out to get people to come down to the pool once a week for a meet and greet and social and hang out. I mean, that's an element of what we do. That's recreation, right? It's community building, it's outreach. And so I would say that they're one of the most important roles because a really talented park and recreation professional can really get the community on your side. And when maybe something comes up that you're going to need to pass a tax millage, or you're going to need to go for some funding, or you need to have these conversations. I mean, they're the individuals that are probably know a lot of the people they are going to work with a lot of the people mm -hmm. and you're going to want to have in your corner and be on your side to embrace that. And the other thing too, is that, you know, it's, a multi-billion dollar industry. I will always remind people that we are part of local parks and recreation, but we are really part of the outdoor recreation umbrella, right? When you think of the movie right. industry, there's action films, there's romances, there's thrillers, there's comedies, same with the music industry. Our umbrella is outdoor recreation, and that encompasses everything from national parks to local parks to guided trips to luxury glamping to RVs to people that just like me that just want to go out into the woods on public land and build my shelter from fallen trees and make, yeah. you know, beds out of leaves and stuff like that. And so, you know, that that's a generator and that's post pandemic. And that is a huge selling point when people are thinking about where they want to live, where they want to spend their money. Can you attract a big retailer that is going to come in? Um, and the clothing, outdoor clothing industry, again, part of that outdoor recreation umbrella can you bring all these pieces together? Because if you have a strong park and rec system, if you have strong access to bigger systems, if you give people this opportunity to feel connected to nature in your space, that is going to be an economic driver that is hard to replicate. I would say we're in the golden age of outdoor recreation at the moment. And so you know, take advantage of that. Really, really take advantage of that. And I think that park and rec professionals are hardworking. They're selfless. A lot of us don't go for the glory. Don't get the flowers that we deserve sometimes. Don't want the flowers for the work that we do. And so I think that just being able to recognize that, because if you have a really good park and rec team that is engaging with the community, you're right. It might not seem like buttoned up professional in the sense because any any if you're too buttoned up and too professional and not interpersonal and engaging enough it's going to be hard to be successful in this industry right mm -hmm. the, you, there has to be some kind of element i feel of just talking with people and connecting them and hearing them so i just i think it's really important just to embrace those individuals embrace professionals who are outgoing who you know, put themselves there. They're hardworking. They're individuals who want to get the job done, that want to see the community thrive and have passion and just understand that they're part of a team just as important as anybody else in your government structure. And there's a space for silliness and outgoing and community. And there's a space for buttoned up and professional and it all blends together. Yeah, I think these these folks in these parks and rec spaces have a lot of versatility and skill set. Um, from what I've seen over the years, um, you know, they can pull off miracles uh, that not a lot of people can pull off. Um, and at the same time are are not paraprofessionals, right? They are true professionals mm -hmm. in the sense of the word um, and have that great connection to community. So I always think about um, sort of those are those staff is our secret weapon, right? <laughs> they they can be in those spaces and and do things that not a lot of others can do. And so it's really, uh, great when you have those folks as a part of your your team. They are your thought partners, um, and uh, they they also know the land, right? So they know the the quirks about topography or what grows where, or what species of bird lives where, um, and a lot of that can be helpful as you're planning, you know, for local government uh, uh, type work. So um, great great yeah. leaders in their own right. Well, you mentioned, Anthony, uh, in our last question, a little bit about, um, you know, being in these these physical spaces. Given all of that, what are some of your not to be missed parks? Um, well, there's a few. <clears throat> so I'm going to keep it in Michigan because um, I encourage everybody to visit Michigan at some point in their life. If you have the opportunity, our Great Lakes in the summer are a sight to behold. I mean, you might think you're in the Caribbean, quite honestly. And so Sleeping Bear, 
Dunes National Lakeshore is gorgeous. Some of the best views in the country of the water, the sand, um, the opportunity to hike up and down the dune. If you so please, just know it's about $3,000 if you have to get rescued from the bottom. Um, but there's a lot of people. <laughs> There's, there's a lot, I don't, it doesn't happen very often. There's usually a lot of people around too to kind of help you out as well. And there's some boats that hang out down at the bottom also. So good, good um, tip. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, really cool. The upper peninsula of Michigan is still very rustic, still very rural. Um, just kind of a slower way of life and a lot of dispersed camping, rustic camping. So it's, it's gorgeous. I mean, when you think of the national parks that we have out West and all around this country and, you think even of getting down to Florida to visit the Everglades or the Grand Canyon, I would encourage you to add Michigan to the list. I mean, the entire West coast of the state is a lot of sleepy resort towns, um, which is very quaint. It's a nice drive. And the upper peninsula is gorgeous. And Mackinac Island is really fun as well too. So I would say that's definitely a not miss. Um, and then honestly, you know, we were down in Dallas for NRPA last year and I had never been to Dallas before. And so I okay. wasn't quite sure what to expect. And a lot of the city parks around there are just really, really cool. It's a really cool city. And I like the opportunity with the history of the cattle industry down there and the Cowboys in Texas and kind of walking around. I thought that I was like, you know, I, I wouldn't have initially thought of it as a, a city to visit. Um, but now that I've been there, it's a city I wouldn't mind going back to and kind of checking out Fort Worth as well. So I would say Michigan or I guess Dallas, Texas. I'm not a Cowboys fan. I just thought the city was neat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and, and ELGL hosts the uh, annual City Hall Selfie Day. Uh, so uh, I'm constantly traveling to new places. Uh, and when I do, I, I stop by their City Hall to get a City Hall Selfie. But I've also found myself when I travel to these places, um, you know, getting my selfie with like their parks and rec maintenance truck with their city seal on the side because I'm <laughs> like, know. oh, those are my people. <laughs> so it's really cool to shout out to the city of Dallas and their parks and rec uh, uh, amenities there. That's a that's a, a good find. <laughs> So Anthony, tell us a little bit about um, your current role. Uh, we, we, we briefed on it uh, before, um, but in particular, uh, sort of you've, you've had these opportunities to look at Parks and Rec and work in these places with different sort of approaches or lenses and from different parts of the industry. Um, you recently made a shift over to a new role. What kind of things were you thinking about when you decided to take this role and, and what do you do in your new job? Yeah, and that's, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. So um, I work for a company now, um, Playcore. And so Playcore is the parent company to some of our larger playground builders out there, like Game Time, Park and Play Structures, and a few others as well, too. We have a very vast, um, very vast catalog of brands that we work with. And so I had the opportunity to meet with my supervisor at NRPA last year and talk a little bit. And the job kind of just, you know, evolved. There was this opening and, you know, they were looking for, I think, somebody with my skill set and opportunity because I've had experience going out to state conferences, being in the association world, the other state associations speaking. And we grew into it. And then I started this year at the start of the year. And so it's been a fantastic journey. I really appreciate the work that we do. Um, and so what I do is in professional development, for PlayCore, we have a scholar network that we work with. We have a lot of evidence-based research that we share, and it's opportunities to have discussions around accessibility. It's opportunity to have discussions around funding. It's opportunity to look at a playground, which I was once a child playing there, <clears throat> right? Mm -hmm. Then I became a rec professional. And then I became an association management professional. And now I'm looking at the playground from a different perspective and how important it is that that playground is accessible, that it is inclusive, the importance of play, amongst so many other topics that we have a broad range that we discuss. But it's really a fun opportunity to view the industry from this lens and still maintain that connection to parks and recreation, still maintain the network work with some brilliant minds, some very passionate individuals, people that truly care about making communities better. 
and <clears throat> again, take that, that national lens to it, which I really like as well too. So I really enjoyed the leap from local to statewide when I was with M parks and working with the DNR and working with all these big statewide agencies and traveling and just having an impact on Michigan. But now the opportunity to step even further back and look at opportunities within the United States and other countries as well, too. There's a lot of work that we do um, in Canada and other places also. And so it's really <clears throat> amazing. Um, you know, if you want to join me in this, I will plug education.playcore.com. It's, you know, free to log in, sign up, create an account, and then all of our continuing education opportunities for a CPRP or E or people who are landscape architects and things of that nature. You know, we have webinars and different series and in-person events and we travel around to conferences and we do all these big state initiatives as well too. Playcore came to Michigan last year and did a state initiative that had some funding behind it and the opportunity to work with local governments to get some really innovative and fantastic new state-of-the-art playgrounds in these communities to best serve their communities. So I think that that's really cool as well too. And so I, I enjoy it quite a bit. Like I said, I'm still new here, but I think my passion, for professional development, my passion for engaging with communities and building out this network and ultimately just remembering what it was like to be a kid in that space and having the opportunity to recreate that <clears throat> for more children, for more families, to make it more accessible, more inclusive, I think is really a fantastic way to spend my day in my professional mm -hmm. time. So. I'm very excited about it and I'm very excited to still be in the park and recreation and outdoor recreation space. Yeah, that exponential impact uh, that, that we can make as professionals is a pretty special thing. So as we wrap up today, tell us what's next for you. What are you working on that our local government listeners uh, should look out for? Yeah, so I would say, you know, the big thing with PlayCore definitely right now, like we're doing some state initiatives, we'll continue those, the opportunity to come to state park and recreation conferences and just work, you know, with every facet of municipal recreation as well, too. Um, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to, like I said, share this evidence-based research, these really innovative ideas to be a leader in the space and in designing inclusive play structures. And we're even working, I mean, it doesn't just go, it goes beyond just, you know, a playground in a park. You know, we obviously work with schools, we work with face centers, we work with a bunch of uh, different groups. So we also work with, in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee, where I lived for 11 years, the Ability Center. And so the Ability Center is a sprawling campus of, you know, accessibility and inclusion and all these different things. And so I think I'm really excited about that. You know, I'm really excited to get out there and still have the opportunity to go to a state conference and present and talk about these ideas and network and engage and see my friends as they're all growing in their careers as well. And always just continue to advocate for the power of parks and recreation. You know, I know I kind of went off a little bit earlier on a tangent when we were talking about like, what do we want our executives and our city managers and everybody to know, but it really is just that power of parks and recreation to change impact, influence lives. And yes, it's an economic driver, but it is a life driver. It is a community driver. It is a sense of health and safety and well being, And it is extremely important that we whatever role we're in, that we embrace that, that we support that. And then we put that at the forefront because this is what people need. And we've seen that they need it. And coming out of the pandemic, we need it more than ever. Um, so I'm excited for what comes next. I'm really excited to see where our industry grows. And I think that whether you're getting outdoors to play in a playground or you're skiing or you're hiking or you're walking or you're just bird watching or you're looking out a window and just admiring something that is, you find to be beautiful. I mean, that just continues to foster this component of conservation and love for the outdoors and respect for nature that at any level is important. Well, you heard it here first, folks. Go find your park and get outside. So, Anthony, if you could be the Gov Love DJ, what song would you pick as the exit music for this episode? 
I think it would have to be the Park and Rec theme song. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect choice. It up. Yep. <clears throat> they would have to. Intro and exit, you know? I love it. Do you have a particular favorite character from the Parks and Rec TV show? I was always partial to Andy. I always thought he was kind of funny and goofy. Um, you know, I really just, just how kind of like silly he was with everything. So I always really liked Andy and I always appreciated Leslie's passion as well too. But I would say those two are definitely my favorite from the show. Nice. Well, we will be sure to find the Parks and Rec theme song uh, to play you out for today's episode. So thank you so much, Anthony, for being here. I, it makes my little park heart happy to hear that there are passionate professionals in this industry. Um, and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today on GovLove. Thank you. All right, folks, that ends our GovLove episode for today. Um, thank you to Anthony for coming on and talking with me. Um, it's been a great chat. Please subscribe to GovLove on your favorite podcast app. New episodes drop every Friday. And if you're ready to already subscribe to GovLove, go tell a friend or colleague about this podcast or share on social media. Help us spread the word that GovLove is the go-to place for local government stories. GovLove is brought to you by ELGO, engaging local government leaders. The best way to support GovLove is to become an ELGL member. You can reach us online at elgl.org slash GovLove or at GovLove Podcast on LinkedIn, Instagram, and X. Thanks for listening. This has been a GovLove podcast about local government.